Welcome back to Ceramics Class. Today we are going to be talking about color. Now, dude, color is weird. Color is reflected light that we somehow interpret. Not only that, but color is cultural. You know, if, if you come from a different culture, they might not even have words for the colors that we have because there's no defining line between when red merges into orange. There's a million red oranges in between. And, and colors have feelings, you know? We have cool colors and warm colors. And how we use color affects the feel and the aesthetic of the finished piece. So I'm gonna turn the camera around for a second. And first of all, now, now the, here's some, some bisque that I have that I wanna to glaze today. But glazing is just one option. For example, this little guy, uh, I didn't want it to be glazed. It's not, it's not for drinking or eating food off of, so it didn't have to be glazed. Um, so I used watercolor for that. Now this one, once again, it's a drum, so it doesn't need to be eaten off of. That's painted with acrylic paint and, and glitter. If you have a specific color in mind, then you might want to consider paint rather than glaze. So, what is glaze? Glaze is glass. And I'm not going to get too deep into the, the chemistry of it because the colors come about from chemical reactions that happen in the kiln. And because of that, it's a little bit uh, tricky to predict what the colors are going to look like. And I'm going to flip this around again. Here are some glazes that I have prepared for Ceramics 1 classes. And you can see I've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Roy G. Bip. Um, and I also have white and black. So let's talk for a minute about, oh, okay, before I do. The colors that you see here in the jar, oh, I can't do that one-handed. Can I do it left-handed? No, I can't. Oh, there we go. The colors that you see in the jar are not the colors that you'll get, okay? This color is a lie. What do I mean by that? Well, the color that you see in there is an added dye. Without that dye, it would just look maybe white or off-white or gray even. Um, if I were to, to put that glaze on something and fire it to maybe 500 degrees, that, that dye would burn out and it would just look white or gray. But as I continue to fire and the temperature gets up to, uh, gets up to uh, the maturing temperature of the glaze, that glaze melts and turns into molten glass. And when it does that, the chemicals in there, the, the, the metallic oxides or the chloride, uh, chlor, chlorides, chlorine, I don't know. Chemistry was so long ago. Um, they react and they, they, they start to become the color that they will. But in fact, they don't become the actual color that you see in the finished product until it cools down. Once it cools down to about 200 degrees, then I can open the kiln and look and see all the beautiful colors that they become. So the reason that there's a dye added is just so that you can get an idea of what the finished product is going to look like. Because if you had, you know, three different shades of white that you had to picture were going to turn into blue and purple and red, it would be um, it'd be very difficult to to plan out and to actually to do the piece. Um, now, if uh, switching topics, when we're in class um, in the before times. The, the room back there was, the, was the, uh, the glazing room. And we always want to separate clay from glaze. We don't want those to mix. We don't put the glaze on the pottery until it's already been bisque fired. Um, so that helps to keep it, you know, keep, keep them separated. You don't ever want them to mix. Now we can't separate physically because that's a very small room back there. And we can't fit a bunch of people back there all glazing. So this year we have to separate by time. So there will be a time that you are glazing and a time that we're using clay, but there won't be a time when we're do doing both at once. So this is, you know, kind of a nightmare to, to, to plan ahead and, and organize this, but we're going to make the best of it. Um, so the glazes that we have, I'm going to switch it around again. Are you getting dizzy yet? Glazes that we have, these are all the same brand um, all the same uh, series of that brand, and as such, these are intermixable. 
but that's not always the case. And another thing is, you know, I hated to have to pour them into these individual jars, but if we have, you know, 50 people touching the same jug and spreading germs, that would be bad too. So I've tried to, to label these with the brand, the color, and the series number, um, because I was left with a bunch of these when I first got here to, to PHS. And the label says Laguna, and it says kitchen yellow, but then it scrawled over there red. I don't know what's in that jar. I have no way to know if it is dinnerware safe, if it's lead free, if it is uh, even a glaze. It might be an underglaze uh, or it might be a paint or stain. I don't know. So I've tried to label these a little bit better so that if, you know, if I leave here or, you know, whatever, the next person has an easier time of, of recognizing these because not all glazes. Not all glazes are dinnerware safe. There are glazes that have lead in them. Um, that's been illegal in, in glazes, uh, particularly in schools, for a long time. But lead's very fun very useful in, in glaze. Um, so it was used in glazes for a long time. Um, all of these glazes are lead free, and all of these glazes in there are dinnerware safe. But that's not always the case, so it's important to read labels. Um, those glazes that are out there for Ceramics One are not the entirety of our glaze collection. We have other kind of specialty glazes that we can use as well. Um, so if you don't see exactly what you want, but you have a, a strong idea and it has to be functional, you can talk with me and we'll see if you know we can either mix up what you want or find one that I already have. Um, but if it's something, you know, like sometimes people will say, I made this rose, but you don't have a rose colored glaze. You only have red and it's too shiny red and blah, 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 blah. Well, use acrylic paint because with acrylic paint, you mix the colors and what you see when they're mixed is what they're going to look like when they're dry. With glaze, you mix the colors and what you see when they're mixed, you really don't know what it's going to be until it comes out of the kiln. All right. So that being said, I'm going to pick, well, you know what? Switch gears again. This is a color wheel that I just scrawled up on the whiteboard. And it's important to know a little bit about color theory. We've got blue, red, and yellow. Those are approximately the primary colors. Okay, I say approximately because if you've ever bought ink for a computer printer, you know that they are uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, so cyan's a little bit different from blue, magenta's a little bit different from red, but these are an approximation of the primary colors. In other words, I can't mix colors to get blue. I can't mix colors to get red. I can't mix colors to get yellow. They're primary, they're the, they're the basic ones. If I do mix any two primary colors, I get a secondary color. The secondary color is purple, orange, green. So if I mix yellow and blue, I get green. If I mix red and yellow, I get orange. If I mix red and blue, I get purple. Um, the glazes over here are intermixable, but they're also layerable, which when you layer glazes, different things happen. Sometimes the glaze will kind of one, the top glaze will kind of float and spread out over the other one. Sometimes it'll be absorbed by the, the base coat. So when we're glazing, I'm going to recommend that you pick two colors and you're going to have a base color and an accent color. Now the colors you choose, like I said, are going to determine the feel of the finished product. Now, it's been said to me before, and I believe it's mostly true, that good glaze can't fix a bad pot. So if you've got an ugly form, no combination of these is going to, is going to fix it. Um, but if you have a good form, or even a decent form, then choosing the colors based on what, what feel you're going for is going to enhance that form. So before I said, we've got warm colors over here and cool colors over here. So that's going to be, uh, that could be a determining factor. Not only that, but how much emphasis, how much impact you want it to have, how exciting you want that to be. You can pick colors that are opposite of each other. These are called complementary colors. Okay. And they really pop. They're very vibrant. Okay. It's a lot of, of um, contrast between the two. So I, I think today for one of mine, I'm going to pick blue and orange because I want it to be really excited and funky. Um, if you want it to be more laid back and, and mellow, then you could pick colors that are side to side of each other. They're called analogous colors. They kind of are mellow, they get along, they're harmonious. So, you know, if I start with a base coat of blue and I want it to pop, I might add yellow. Or maybe even just go slightly off and you do a, a yellow red or a, a red, uh, yellow orange or, did I say yellow red? Yellow red would be orange. Orange red or 
yellow, orange, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, but if I want it to be more calm and mellow than I'm, and the base coat was, was blue, then I might pick green or I might go the other way and pick purple. And that's gonna have less contrast to be more mellow. Now, what about black or white or brown or gray? Those, those are neutrals, okay? They're not on the color wheel. They'd kind of just be in the middle. Because if I mixed all three of the primary colors together, I'd get something in the center and it would be brown or uh, black or gray, depending on the pigments that are in the, the, uh, the paints or glazes. So if I pick the absolute most amount of contrast that I can achieve, is going to be black and white because black is a mix of all the colors and white is none of them. So that would have the most amount of visual contrast. Um, so choose the colors, you know, take, take some time to think about what you're trying to, what feeling you're trying to evoke with the piece and, and, and pick the colors accordingly. So I said I was going to pick orange and blue for one and I'm going to pick, hmm, I'm going to pick, I'm going to do uh, blue and purple on the other one because I want that other one to be more mellow. So that, those are going to be the, the color combinations that I'm going to pick. All right, when you come in on a glazing day, you'll have a, a blue tray. That's to keep the glaze from dripping on the, uh, the cement board. Um, you'll have fresh water. You know, there won't be any uh, uh, clay residue in the water. You'll tell me what glazes you want and, and I'll get those for you. So we're not touching, you know, you're not, you're not sharing these, okay? Your germs stay on your thing until the end and then you, when you clean up, you'll wipe down everything before you turn it back in. You need a clean brush for every glaze you use. Um, you know, because if I'm using orange and glazing it on there and then dip it into the blue, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some orange in the blue and then this won't look the same for the next person who uses it. Um, all right, now I'm going to uh, fast forward here in a minute because you don't need to see me just applying the, the glaze on there. But before I do, I want to tell you, the only part that you don't glaze is the foot, okay? Because when that becomes molten in the kiln, it'll fuse through the kiln shelf. That's called dry footing. When you, want to, when you have no glaze on the foot, it's called a dry foot, okay? Um, I can glaze inside this foot ring because it's raised enough from, from the shelf where it, where it sits. So the only part that will be unglazed is just this foot ring. Um, you know, if it's not dry footed, it's not going to get fired. So it's very important to understand that dry footing means that there is no glaze on where it actually sits. Now, if you have uh, an object that is unstable, you have to figure out where it rests. You know, just sit it on the table and, and don't touch it for a second to see where where does it where does it balance? Because I'm not going to spend time trying to balance it just right in a certain uh, configuration in the kiln. It's just it's not possible. Um, now, if you do get a little bit of, of glaze on the bottom, you just take your sponge and wipe it off. Uh, even if it dries on there, you can still wipe it off. Uh, you know, and it's important, you should probably do that anyway because if, you know, sometimes glaze will drip on the tray and you'll put it down without realizing that there's glaze on the bottom. And if there's glaze on the bottom, it's not dry footed, it will not get fired. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, my base color blue on both of these, okay? So I'm gonna do a base color of blue on this and then I'll do an accent color of orange on this. Then I'm gonna do a base coat of blue on this one and accent color of purple and I'm gonna show you a couple different ways to accent. Now there's a million different ways to do this, okay? There's a million different ways to apply color to a form but I'm just gonna show you a few and hopefully give you some ideas. But I'm gonna do that in fast forward so that you don't have to watch me applying glaze. All right, I've got the first coat on both of these. You may have noticed I couldn't reach a paintbrush inside of this one, so I just poured the glaze in it and swirled it around and flipped it over and poured the excess glaze back out. You only have to do that once because that puts a pretty thick coat on there. But with the brushing, one coat's not gonna be enough because when it, when it fires, you'll see the, the brush strokes, you'll see, see the thin areas. So if I want a nice, solid blue, I'm gonna need to do at least two, maybe even three coats. All right, a couple things you might have noticed. First off, the glaze dries on there fairly quickly, especially the first coat, because the bisque is so porous, it's just absorbing the moisture right out of the, the glaze. The second coat takes a little bit longer to, to dry, but that at least ensures me that I have pretty good coverage. 
Uh, if I notice a spot that's drying out quicker than the other spots, that might be a spot that I didn't get enough glaze on. Another thing you might notice is that I've got a bare spot from where I was handling it. Okay, I had a thumb at the bottom and two fingers at the top when I was glazing the handle. It becomes a challenge to figure out where to grip it when you're when you're glazing, because if you touch the glaze when it's when it's wet or when it's you know still um, not dry, when it's not when it's it kind of thickens on there. Um, if I touch that, the glaze will stick to my finger and pull off of the the uh, pot. So check if that's happened. You just kind of you know touch it up. So for my third coat, it's not really going to be a third coat. I'm just going to touch up here and there where I think the glaze might be thin. And then I'm going to let it dry before I do my, my accent color. Um, now you don't have to worry about the, the bumpy brush strokes showing because glass has a very high surface tension. So when this is molten, as long as there's enough glaze on there, the, the surface tension of the glass will, will pull the uh, glaze together and make it... Um, make it smooth. So I'm going to let this dry and then I'll show you what I'm going to do for my accent colors. All right, my base color of blue is done. You can see that I got some on the, the foot though. So I'm just going to... I could wait to do this at the end. I'm going to do it now and, and at the end just to be extra careful. But I'm just wiping it off on there to dry foot it. Now it's got a nice clean foot. Um, so I'm going to do orange accent color on this for high contrast. I forgot to mention you got to check the lid and then shake it. Trust me, you want to check the lid. Can't tell you how many times someone's shaking it and whoosh, that's a bad day. Now for this, I'm going to do one of my favorite things to do is I'm just going to drip glaze on the outside, on, on, the, uh, on the rim. And to get the drips just right, takes kind of a, a careful touch. And I've, I've developed this technique over decades and decades, so I'll share it with you now. Load your brush up, okay? Load it up with glaze. And then instead of painting it on, I'm gonna scrape it on the side, okay? Kind of scraping it on the, the side. It's already starting to drip, but if it doesn't drip far enough, then Then um, after I get it all the way around the rim, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tap the, the mug on my hand. Ah, oh, getting this everywhere. Okay, I'm just going to tap it on my hand and see how that pulls the... camera pulls the uh, drips down further that's what I'm going for really nice and I could drip on the inside as well but I had an idea that I wanted to try and I have no idea if this will look good on this because I've I've done this on the outside of, of mugs and cups before I've never done, tried doing it on the inside but basically I better take my ring off for this basically I'm gonna Paint the glaze on the palm of my hand on this doily. So doily. Let me turn it now. And these glazes are non-toxic, so I don't need to worry about getting it on my skin. Another reason you want to check labels. Now the important part of this is making sure that you don't um, move the doily on the side of it. I want to I want to place it on in a way that it doesn't smudge. So maybe if I fold it like this, yeah, and then press it down to transfer that glaze. And alternatively, alternately to this, you could put the uh, doily on dry and then paint the glaze over top of it and get the reverse of the doily. So where all the holes would be, it'd be like a, almost like a stencil. All right, now peel this back up. Oh, I didn't get it right here. Uh, 
All right, let's see what I got. That's kind of neat. I'll take that. Now, I don't know if that is kind of a um, light coating of orange there, so I don't know if that will, um, like here the orange is really thick on the blue, so those that'll probably stay orange. But where it's thin on the blue, the blue might kind of absorb it. When you layer glazes, it's a little bit less predictable. So because of that, I'm going to do drips on the inside as well, which is lighter, a lighter touch. I'm going to put this on the tray so I don't drip on the table. I'm not a big fan of uh, sharp fine lines and things like that. Nothing wrong with them. If, if you like that, that's your aesthetic choice. But for me, I like things that are that are drippy and you know flowy and naturey. And some glazes will kind of accent the um, the texture because I have a texture on this cup. Some glazes will accent the texture, other glazes will cover it, and knowing which is which is just about trial and error. So you've really got to embrace the unexpected. All right, so I'm going to let that dry, and I'll dry foot it again, and then I'll, it'll be ready to fire. So I've got one more accent. Remember, these are complementary colors, blue and orange. I'll be, you know, real intense contrast there. For this one, I want it to be um, less intense, so I'm going to do uh, purple on blue. Um, and I'm going to show you a completely different one, but i got to wash my hands first so I don't accidentally get any orange on that. I just remembered why I, had, um, why I had this out. It was to remind me that if you have something with a lid, that needs to be dry-footed and fired separately. Okay, so the lid, that's why I told people to sign their lids. So this lid will need to be, when I glaze it, uh, when it sits, it only sits, it only touches in three or four spots. So when I dry-foot it, Pretend there's glaze on this. When I dry foot that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the um, sponge, put it down on the table so it's level, and then put that and just drop it like that so that it's level, and then just rub it like this. And that'll take off the glaze only on the spots that actually touch the shelf. Um, if we were to fire these together with glaze on them, that would fuse shut, and that's no good. So that's why you got to do it separately and dry foot both of them. Um, all right, so on this one, I'm going to try something a little different. I think you're going to like it. I think it's going to turn out really cool. I cut out a little uh, post-it note um, silhouette of a butterfly. And I've got two, two tries to do this, one on each side. So if it works on the first try, I won't do it on the other side. But if it doesn't work on this side, I get a second shot. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to dip this in the water so that the paper will dip it in the water and pat it dry with a sponge. How about that? Yeah, that's using the needle. All right, pat it dry. Not really dry, damp. Pat it damp. And then I'm going to, because it's wet, it'll stick to the uh, surface. And it doesn't matter if I get this glaze, you know, if I get water on this glaze, I don't think it's gonna affect anything, but I'm just gonna make sure that it's good and stuck on there. And then, instead of brushing the glaze over top of this, I'm going to take this brush, this stiff bristle brush. Oh, I forgot to shake this. Shake the purple. Do you remember the shake weight infomercials? I feel like shaking glazes is how I got so buff. Why are you laughing at that? So I'm just going to load up my brush like this. And then flick it. Probably shouldn't do this towards that one. Oh, I might have some purple on it now. Oh well. Making sure, making sure to get the purple all around the edges here. If you're going to do this in class, be really careful about who's sitting, sitting near you. That's pretty good, I think. I'm going to let that dry and then do it again so that I have a thicker buildup of the purple because, because there's not a lot of contrast between the analogous colors of purple and blue, I want to make sure that I have enough of that purple that it's not going to just soak into the blue and disappear. So 
So I'll give that a couple minutes. All right, I think it's working pretty well, so I don't think I'm gonna do this again on the other side. But what I am gonna do is just a little bit more, now that it's dried, a little bit more around the butterfly. And then just kind of lightly here and there around the rest of it so there'll be some splashes of purple. Kind of randomly, you don't want to overdo it. Maybe a couple around the rim. All right, and then making sure I don't have any wet glaze on my hand. I'm going to very carefully peel off the butterfly and that will be a blue butterfly surrounded by purple sprayed on, um, looks sprayed on paint. And then this just goes in the trash can. All right, so now what's next? Well, first thing we got to do Make sure we cap up all of the glazes. Glaze is expensive. A gallon of this Amico Blue was $70. So we don't want to waste any of it. So if you, um, if you have to mix colors in a little paint tray or something like that, we're not going to pour that down the sink when you're done. I have two buckets in the other room. One is labeled Warm Mystery, and the other one is labeled Cool Mystery. And what those are, are mystery glazes. If I have, if I mixed up my own custom shade of orange, that would be a warm color. I'd put it, I'd dump out the remainder. You know, I can't put it back in the jar because that would contaminate the jar. I'd put the remainder in the warm mystery. And once that bucket gets full, I, um, I uh, crush it all up and grind it in a blender. And then we have a brand new glaze and it's mystery glaze because we don't know what it's gonna look like. So if you have a whole bunch of glaze on a brush like this, hey, that's money. See if you can scrape some of that glaze back into the jar. It's another reason we don't want to use the same brush for more than one color. Um, I'll even, you know, when I use up a gallon jug of, of glaze, I'll even, um, you know, rinse that out into the mystery uh, bucket because, you know, the crusty dry glaze on the inside of the jar is too valuable to get rid of. Now, so that we're not all running up to the sink is why we'll have fresh water in each bucket. You're gonna just wash, we'll try this out. I'm not sure how well it's gonna work, but we'll wash the uh, brushes in the buckets. And so get your sponges out of there. Non-dominant hand goes in the bucket. Dominant hand paints circles. I even in view, I'm not, all right. Let's get this over. Okay, your dominant hand paints circles onto your non-dominant hand with a paintbrush underwater. Get all of the glaze from out of between the bristles. Shake it a few times and then when I collect it, we'll put them bristles up in the cup so that they dry for the next person. And I want to do that. Keep in mind that there's a little bit of bleach in the water so you will have to wash your hands in the sink after you do this. But this will keep, you know, we don't want to have 30 kids lined up at the sink coughing on each other. And, oh, if there's Glaze on the ferrule, you know, just kind of wipe that off in the in the water as well. Give it a couple shakes. I didn't use this brush, so it's still clean, but I did use this brush, so. And then I'm gonna rinse this out. And I am not done yet, obviously, because I also need to clean that blue tray disinfect it and clean the, the drips of glaze because the next person who comes here to glaze isn't going to want to, you know, if they put their, their pot down on there, they're going to get your glaze on the bottom of their pot. That's just rude. Put that to dry. Okay, um, if you have wet hands, you don't want to touch the, uh, the dry glaze because even if it's just damp fingers, sometimes the glaze will stick to your finger and peel off the, the pot. So I shake my hands. Dry, dry them on my pant legs. Okay, now remember uh, the, the, the sponge, I'm gonna do one last check of the foot of this. And you can see, ooh, good thing I checked. Look at that, that would not get fired. So I'm gonna put it on my sponge and just make circles. And 
yet a couple times until there's no glaze on the bottom. And that should suffice. Okay. Um, the glaze one is molten might run a little bit, but you notice that when I pushed it down on the sponge, the sponge went up around that foot ring a little bit. So there's a you know a millimeter or two of, of space, and that actually took the glaze off of here as well, but that's okay. Kind of like the look of that. Now this one's gonna be harder because I can't touch the rim where it's still drippy wet. So sometimes it's a challenge to figure out, you know, like where you can grip something. So I'm gonna put my thumb here on the outside and there on the inside in order to you know, to, to be able to pick it up. And then these are going to go on the shelf in the other room. And, um, and once that shelf is... Why do we need bells on a Friday? Um, once that shelf is full, then we'll fire those. Now, glaze firing is a lot quicker than uh, bisque firing. Bisque firing takes about three days. Glaze firing happens in about a day. And once those are done, uh, some of them will go in the display cases. Some of them we might keep for art shows if we ever have art shows again. I'm going to be optimistic. We're going to have art shows again. Um, and some of them you'll get to take home. So that, opening up a glaze fire, a glaze kiln, a glaze load, whatever you call it, always feels like Christmas to me. It's always the most exciting part. Everything is so shiny and jewel-like and, you know, best part of my job. Well, maybe not the best part. One of the best. Okay, so I got all the glaze off of this, and this is disinfected now because the water has some bleach in it. Um, on class days like this, I will collect all the, the glazes and brushes at the end of class. So your responsibility is cleaning the brushes, cleaning the, the trays, making sure that there's no uh, drippings or leavings anywhere. So it's ready, ready to go for the next person. So I, I apologize for this being a somewhat long video. It went longer than I thought. I got kind of long-winded. Who would have thought that would happen? Um, but hopefully I've given you some good ideas because, uh, you know, glazing, it's not my favorite part. I think sometimes if I have a lot of things to glaze, it's kind of tedious. But the results of it, that's the exciting part. You know, you don't get that instant feedback of when you're actually making something out of clay, that instant gratification. But once you do see what you've done and you see the results, it's, it's worthwhile. So hopefully you've gotten some good ideas and you'll be ready uh, next week in class to start glazing your work. I'll see you then.